Starting off, we're going to identify common requirements for grad school. We're going to go over all the little pieces that you need to successfully apply. And in the meantime, we're going to try to think about how you create an individualized action plan. Uh, we'll be referencing Michael, who is uh, considering grad school applications at this current time and sort of how he thinks about his action plan going forward. So I'll dive into the basics, but there's a couple things to know just with beginning the process. Okay, so what the application form looks like is selecting your program. You're going to have to put your name and contact information. You're going to have to report your citizenship status. Um, they're going to ask for education and GPA information absolutely hands down. Um, you know, if you have any employment opportunities, if you are looking for an assistantship or anything like that, and you're going to have to upload some of those materials into that application. Um, a lot of times you're going to need to apply potentially two different places. Okay, so one is just the university graduate school. Um, and that's just kind of an overarching, um, uh, I guess you'd call it a department, right, is the graduate school. And then you may also have to, in addition, apply for the actual departmental program that you're interested in um, studying for. So that's kind of something to keep in mind as you're looking at application timelines and application deadlines. Is it just the one application or are there two parts? Um, fees will also be part of the application process as well. To give you a frame of reference, UGA's application fee is around the $75 to $100 range. You may be able to look into some um, fee waivers, some application fee waivers. That's just going to depend on your circumstances and building a relationship with um, you know, the graduate school or the program. You'll also want to plan for uploading transcripts. Okay, so this is something that I actually really struggled with. It was probably my number one obstacle as I was applying for graduate schools. I didn't realize that you got to like fork over a chunk of change to request your transcripts and then it takes like seven to 14 days for it to get there. So the earlier you start planning on sending your transcripts out, the better um, because a lot of times it takes some money and, and then you have to um, you know, wait for the mail time also to get to the graduate program that you're interested in. Uh, so Michael, this may all be pretty self-explanatory, but any comments you have on this part of the process? Um, nothing crazy other than I definitely agree with Bree. I had to send out an official transcript for an internal application at UGA one time and I almost <laughs> missed the deadline because of the delay that occurs. So I highly recommend getting on top of that early. Great. Um, so the next thing to draw our attention to, um, if the application form is like your job application, you're uploading materials that like kind of let the admissions committee get to know you a little bit. Um, so sometimes grad schools will ask for a resume or CV. A uh, question I often get is what is the difference between the two? So a resume you may be more familiar with. One pager usually uh, it's tailored, meaning like you only list like some of your most relevant experiences and highlight your skills and abilities. And uh, the purpose of the document is to communicate what your education level is and what are some experiences in your background. But it can also include things like skills, accomplishments, um, volunteer work, community involvement, campus involvement, all kinds of stuff can go on there. Um, and then a CV or a curriculum vitae, and I hope I'm saying the Latin term correctly, our linguistics major can correct me if need be. Um, the CV is extensive meaning it is longer. So um, as an undergrad, you might have a CV that could be like two pages long because it is a detailed list of everything that you've accomplished in terms of academics, involvement, and experience. Um, it may be longer than that, but that's usually what I see is not a huge difference between the length of an undergraduate resume versus undergraduate CV. And definitely as you get into grad school, if you are prompted to create a CV, uh, your resume might extend up to three to six pages by the time you're done with graduate school. And if you become like one of your faculty or professors, um, their CV is going to be um, 30 to 50 pages, uh, depending on the amount of publications and presentations that they do. Uh, they can look very similar in terms of formatting, but you'll notice the CV has maybe some slightly different emphasis on the categories that it will focus on at the very top, meaning teaching, research, publications, presentations, these kinds of things that an academic is used to doing, that is what is prominently featured on a CV over work experience in the more traditional sense. Uh, but at any time you can navigate to our website to see resume samples. 
uh, so that if you're starting from scratch or you want to redo your resume, you'll have a format that saves you a lot of room and is pretty clean presentation um, from us. And then we also have uh, some career guides that can provide examples of resumes and a graduate student career guide that provides examples of CVs if you're curious to know more about those. And I might come slip those into the chat uh, while Bree's telling you about the next thing. Uh, Michael, how do you feel about your resume? So my resume um, is something that, you know, needed some work. So one of the resources that I used is, well, are the two links here, but as well, and this is something we'll mention again toward the end of the presentation, but the Career Center always offers drop-in hours, Monday through Friday from 11 to 2. Um, so I highly recommend checking those out. It's super helpful, 10 to 15 minutes where somebody who knows what they're talking about looks at your resume and um, you have really good advice on that. And then a second thing that's just kind of interesting, a lot of your professors will have their CVs on their faculty page of the of like the UGA website. So if you ever want to go just check one out, I can say that I've done that a couple times, um, especially if I'm going to have a meeting with a professor. It's a good way to kind of look over what they have. So it has that twofold service for you guys of, okay, I can see what a resume or sorry, what a CV will look like. And on top of that, I can get to know the research my professors are doing. Most often I see a grad school ask in the same way that we presented it here. Submit your resume or CV. So you get to choose which format works best for you. And most likely there's not going to be a huge difference unless you've been pretty involved in research efforts, presentations um, about that research, and maybe even some teaching experience. Okay, personal statements. One of my favorite things to talk about with students. So um, a lot of times students will come in and say like, I don't even know what to put in this personal statement. I only have 5,000 characters. How do I put my whole life into this statement? First of all, we don't want to put your whole life into the statement, okay? The, the very first thing to think about when you are writing or crafting your personal statement is what is the prompt, okay? Actually answering the question that the graduate school is asking you to write about, um, super, super important and can really help focus the content that you want to share. Typically, a personal statement includes why you're interested in the program, your goals for your time in the program, and then your career following that program. Also focusing on um, you know, the research that you've done on the program. So what do you know about them already and how do you know that it's a good fit? And then some reasons why you're a unique candidate too. So thinking about why you're gonna stand out against all of the other um, applicants for the position or for the program. How do I write it? Um, start just by kind of brain dumping a lot. And then uh, you know, this is a really helpful tool that can help you with. Um, if you, you know, set up an appointment, to really dig in and really drill down into your personal statement once you have a draft created. We love doing that. So um, typically what we look for in a strong personal statement is an organization that focuses kind of on the past and then the present and then the future. Okay, that's going to give you an opportunity to incorporate a lot of those um, those previous bullet points. I also look a lot of times for four components. That's your motivation, your fit, your capacity, and then your vision, okay? Um, a lot of that can get sometimes convoluted, but it's really, really focusing on your internal goals. How do you line up with, um, you know, the vision or the mission of the program, and how can you most clearly communicate that? We always look for stories, details, reflection, and then obviously creating, like, strong writing in, in terms of, like, Paragraph structure, sentence structure, correct grammar, grammar, usage, spelling, all of that good stuff. Um, so before I move the slide, uh, Michael, have you attempted your personal statement at this point or thought about it? So I have written a personal statement um, when applying for a certain scholarship. Um, so it's not exactly the same. However, a lot of the underlying things are the same. Um, it is definitely one of those tasks, I think, that looks like a mountain you have to climb. Um, so it's important to remember, and this is what I have to remind myself a lot of the time, is that it doesn't have to be perfect the first time you write it. And on top of that, as you start writing, you're gonna feel better and better the more you get going. It's a really hard, it has, I call it, a, I say that it has a lot of activation energy. Um, like really getting into it is kind of the most difficult part. Um, but once you start writing it, it is going to probably be easier than you think. 
So um, a big component that is sometimes a little hard to achieve um, if you're um, starting from square one and also takes a ton of time in the graduate application process is securing your letters of recommendation. Uh, first off, uh, one of the questions is like, who can be a good recommender for grad school? Usually um, a lot of the focus is on your uh, professors and instructors because they can speak to your academic achievement and your ability to like engage in class and um, maybe even your dedication to um, school and the field that you're going into. Uh, but the recommender can also include supervisors from work environments that you have uh, worked in. Um, this may be UGA campus related or not. Uh, colleagues from those same work environments might provide a, a good recommendation if they can speak to your ability to be like a successful graduate student and like put in the work to do so. Uh, if you want to sign up for the mentor program like Michael was talking about earlier and establish a strong relationship there and this mentor could be some of those people who uh, maybe write a letter of recommendation for you in the future if you're investing a lot in that relationship. Um, a couple other random examples might be other staff here at UGA like if you're involved in the student organization and it has a faculty or staff advisor who is fairly hands-on and um, gets to know you pretty well as a student in terms of your campus involvement. Um, so feel free to think about your UGA network and, and your networks outside of the campus and uh, sort of lean on those people who know you best and who can write not only a recommendation letter, but a strong recommendation letter that speaks a lot to who you are and what you can do. Usually you need about three letters. That's the typical um, number that I see grad schools recommend. Sometimes they will be specific about who they want to write it. So some might say, if you're going into um, one of my majors, like a psychology program, they might say, you need a, one psychology faculty at least to write a recommendation letter. So you'll want to pay attention to the number of schools that you're applying to and which ones are asking for who to write. And that will give you an indication of how many recommenders you might want to try to line up in the future to write that letter. Um, a tricky part of recommendation letters is like, when do I ask and how do I ask my recommenders to do this for me? So most of the time, in my experience helping students, we're thinking about the deadline that's approaching and how far in advance of the deadline do I need to let somebody know that I need a letter? Because you could possibly follow up with somebody at any time to say, in the future, if I go to grad school, you know, can I come back to you and, and maybe ask for a letter of recommendation? Once they like get to know you, that might be appropriate to ask them. But when you wanna send them like, the details, your resume, your personal statement, all the submission instructions for um, getting that letter to the grad school, I would say at least one month in advance of the deadline and possibly more. Um, some faculty may enjoy six weeks notice, some might prefer two months notice, uh, and it can take a while for a busy member of UGA to get back to writing like a good letter for you because they want to put in that effort. And the more time you give them, the better that letter is probably going to be. I have it in my personal experience that you may need to send a reminder to your recommenders and let them know, hey, thanks so much again for agreeing to do this for me. Just letting you know I've completed all my grad school stuff and the deadline's coming up in a month. You're awesome, thanks. Um, so that gentle reminder can help them get back to business when it comes to um, finishing that letter for you. Uh, let's see, you want to give them all the materials like I just described that helps contextualize who you are, especially if it's been a while since they've had you in class. Just giving them your resume and personal statement can help them um, contextualize what your goals are. And uh, if you're reconnecting with your recommender, so you're in a situation where, you know, it has been a while since I had that really impactful instructor, but I do want them to write a letter of recommendation. Maybe it's been a year since I talked to them. How do I reconnect? I would say try to set up a conversation with them during what they would normally hold as drop-in hours or some convenient time over Zoom or over phone. Or maybe you can start the conversation with what your goals are and give them an update on your life. Get their advice on what to do regarding grad school and your future career goals. And then follow up from that conversation to say, your insight was so helpful. Thanks so much for the advice. Would you be able to write a letter of recommendation for me? I've always you know, really enjoyed your classes and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, maybe they'll be more inclined to say yes, having had that sort of warm introduction to you just prior to your asking. Um, so Michael, any thoughts on, on this process? Um, I think the one thing I will say is that it can be very intimidating 
Um, and obviously, I don't know what everybody's years are here. Um, especially, I know for me, I attended this presentation when I was a first year. And the thought of talking to any of my teachers to the point where I needed to ask them for a letter of recommendation sounded absolutely terrifying. Um, but the one piece of like, I guess, consolation advice I can give is that as you get further and further into your classes, you become less intimidated by your professors. And so you're, you'll eventually develop the relationships, especially when you get into major related courses or smaller courses. Um, where you feel more, much more comfortable asking for something like this. It's a great point, Michael. Thanks for sharing. Okay, the next thing, and I know this was something that several people mentioned in the chat at the very beginning as things that they were nervous about is taking the GRE or any sort of entrance exam um, before their program. So there are a lot of different entrance exams out there. You've probably heard of one or another or a few of these. Um, it really depends on what type of program you're entering, right? So the GRE is kind of just that real basic, real general. Um, a lot of times probably the most um, popular in terms of uh, required entrance exams. You may have heard of the GMAT um, for some MBA programs, the MCAT for medical programs, the LSAT for law, um, law school programs. But each one of them has kind of their own timeline. They have kind of their own cycle and um, they each cost money also. So these are, again, just pieces of the application process you're gonna wanna plan for. Um, consider taking each of these entrance exams at least the semester before you apply, if not a smidge earlier. Um, and for example, to give you kind of a cost example, the GRE costs 200 bucks plus, depending on the type that you take. Um, and it'll take about three and a half hours to complete and then 10 to 15 days for your scores to be sent. So again, thinking about that mail time, thinking about kind of the lag time between when you actually take it versus when it arrives, you're going to want to plan well in advance for a lot of these things um, in advance of the, the application deadline. Michael, Michael I mean, entrance well. exam. Um, the one thing I'll say, it's a lot like, I recommend studying for it the same way you study for the SAT in high school. Um, get that like prep book early on if you can. Um, talk to people that have maybe taken it, see if they have any advice. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is there's a lot of really good study material for free online. Um, you just have to look for it. A quick Google search and scrolling through the first couple pages of links that pull up is kind of what I've been doing so far. So I recommend all of that. Michael, did you take the GRE? I have not taken the GRE yet. I okay. am supposed to take it in the spring. Gotcha. Okay. Um, let us know if you have questions about that, folks, in the Q&A or chat. We would be happy to circle back to this topic about preparing for the test. Um, seeing one chat, let me just make sure I respond to that. But it is hard to see while the presentation is going. There we go. Um, how far in advance should we start studying? Um, my own metric, like personally, four to six weeks. Um, prior that gives me like a week and change to like study each section of particularly the GRE that's the one that I took but some of these others may have more sections to it or more complex material that you want to spend more time studying um, so so everybody will be different in the amount that they like to study for these tests Bree any thoughts on your own history I have a quick caveat um, this is kind of a not a fun fact about me but I tend to tell it every once in a while I actually specifically looked for graduate programs that did not require an entrance exam. So if this is something that really gives you a lot of anxiety, it's something you're like, I can't afford that, I can't study for that. And there are programs that exist out there that do not require um, an entrance exam. And you can definitely filter your search through um, um, cool. One quick thing, and this may also get mentioned again later, but I just wanna say it while we're on the entrance, entrance exam slide, is that it is possible right now due to COVID that some programs have waived the requirement. Um, just make sure you double check for that if you're looking to apply in the next semester or two. Um, I see y'all out there in the Q&A. We will definitely come back for you. Um, and we're just gonna push forward though. Uh, so interview, uh, there's not always an interview when it comes to certain grad programs and then some will require one. 
Usually it's the thing that you do after you have maybe successfully applied to the program and they are inviting you for that sort of round two um, piece of admissions. Um, so when you're preparing, you wanna make sure you know everything about the program going in, everything you can find um, online or by talking to current students or something like that. Um, we will offer mock interview services and we also have a feature called Big Interview on our website where you can practice online um, for any interviews coming up and you can kind of get some feedback from that AI on how you're doing in terms of response. Uh, there are lots of different forms that a grad school interview can take and so you could expect uh, to be informed by the grad school like your interview is going to be one-on-one -on -one, uh, with an admissions counselor or faculty member. It could be a group situation where it's like you and a group of interviewers. Uh, it could be uh, a number of interviewees for one interviewer or it could be multiple of both and one piece of advice i would give in a group interview is make sure you're paying attention to what's going on in the room and actively listening to other people who are talking instead of like me maybe thinking about what my own response would be while other people are giving their responses because that way you are aware of what's going on you can build up other people's energy and answers um, i wanted to quickly mention this multi mini interview format that is um, i've seen it most commonly associated with med school you essentially enter into um, like a space where you are engaging in small activities, maybe six to eight stations, maybe more, maybe less, uh, and they're presenting you with one question to answer at that station and then you move on to the next one. And this station might be uh, a physical activity that you do. It could be an ethical dilemma question. Uh, it could be a, a traditional interview question, like, it, like tell me about yourself, um, and you're given that prompt before you enter into uh, that space to perform your task or give your answer. Um, and then interviews might be open or closed, and you'll probably be informed as to which is which. Uh, open interviews, the interviewer has all of your um, materials to reference, and they know everything about you. A closed interview, they are not looking at your materials, and they are getting to know you from sort of a blank slate. Um, so I'll pause there and say, Michael, any experience or apprehensions when it comes to interviewing for grad school? Um, so right now, as I prepare for possible interviews um, to everybody, I definitely recommend scheduling mock interviews. Um, I did one of those two weeks ago. It's extremely helpful. Um, it, they give you really good feedback and it helps you prepare, maybe not for like, the questions that are specific to your grad program, but they do help you prepare for these more general things like having a pitch about yourself ready to go. Um, and they also keep you on your feet and being able to do that is really important for grad school interviews to be quick on your feet. Um, so I highly recommend big interview and if you have the time to schedule a mock interview. Thanks, Michael. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about deadlines. This is something that we've kind of been dropping all the way through um, very shortly. What is most common um, in terms of deadlines? So for fall start programs, applications will typically open about a year in advance of when you would start that program. And the deadline is uh, one year minus one semester in advance of matriculation. So basically it's like, count back a year, count back a semester, that's when you should shoot for, um, you know, kind of keeping an eye out for this application deadline. Um, you wanna probably start preparing in spring of your third year or of your junior year to apply in the fall of your senior year. Okay, that's gonna give you hopefully enough time to gather all of the elements, um, to gather all of the information that we've been sharing with you today. Um, and do your best to apply early. Don't actually wait till the deadline because you really never know what's going to pop up. You know, if you've got issues uploading your personal statement or if you've got issues that you run into with, um, you know, letters of recommendation not being uploaded correctly, you're going to want to give yourself probably a couple weeks at least um, before that application deadline to get those things figured out and situated. Um, what if I have a gap? This is a question I get a lot. Um, from students who are planning on applying, okay, and they're kind of concerned about a part of their experience or maybe their GPA isn't high enough or they didn't get, you know, X number of internships completed during their undergraduate um, 
their undergraduate uh, career, excuse me, um, think about taking a gap year, okay? If, if all of this is too much to do in a year, uh, maybe you run out of time or maybe it just gets a little bit overwhelming or you decide, I'm not really sure if grad school is the option for me, that would be a really good time to consider taking kind of what we call that gap year. So you can do a lot of different things in your gap year. I typically tell students like, do something that's gonna fill you up a little bit, um, do something that's going to strengthen you as an applicant, but also give you a little bit of a break, a little bit of a breather, so that you can go into the graduate school application process with some renewed energy and some renewed motivation. Um, ways to spend your gap year are working on a certificate program or a specific credential or a license that you may need for your, your chosen career. Um, thinking about relevant employment is really helpful. So consider getting part-time or full-time employment. Um, either one works. You can always look at internships or volunteer positions for that year. You can always look at graduate education rewards. So, you know, potentially like taking some graduate school classes um, or a mixture of all of these things. If you've got two of those that you think you can work into your schedule in that gap year, more power to you. I think that's a really great way to um, like really vary your experience and really become more of a unique candidate uh, than when you were just applying straight from undergrad. Yeah, I was thinking, um, you know, some nonprofit organizations and like if you were like me and worked for UGA um, prior to going to grad school, they may offer some way to, to pay for some of grad school if you work with them for a certain amount of time. Um, so that may also be worthwhile considerations here. Um, but Michael, any thoughts on on deadlines and gap years? Um, I don't have anything else. I think you guys covered it all. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, we're gonna push forward a little bit more. So um, this is a common question for like, I'm starting from square one regarding grad school. You know, maybe you're really early on in your consideration. Um, and so we could talk about researching schools and how to find schools. Um, I've listed some reflection questions here that can help you consider what direction to head with grad school that'll at least give you a roadmap for planning how you're gonna conduct your research. So you can think about Am I going for a master's, a doctoral degree, a professional degree like an MD or a JD um, or some other um, type of after, um, after undergrad graduate school experience that I want to gain? Um, you could start with UGA thinking about like, okay, I, I'm most familiar with this school. Let me see if it offers a program that is similar to what I want. And I can sort of find out what the field is like if I start by looking at UGA's programs. One convenient way to do that as an undergrad is if you wanted to consider the Double Dogs program that offers lots of different degree combinations between um, like an accelerated bachelor's and master's, um, essentially turning the four-year traditional timeline into a five-year traditional timeline to graduate with both degrees. Uh, those Double Dogs programs can outline some avenues that have already been predetermined work with your undergraduate degree to like speak to a career interest. Um, so there's like, I'm a psych major, here's five different degrees that we've paired with it already, if you wanna consider them for a double dogs program. Um, and that might also just shed some light on different directions to go or give you a stepping stone toward that next degree if you're considering something after your master's. Um, one trick that I really love personally is by looking at UGA's programs, is there uh, an accrediting organization that says this degree is valid and good to state licensing boards and employers. And then can I check that accrediting organization for a list of other programs similar to this one? An example being that our clinical psychology doctoral program is accredited by the American Psychological Association. And if I check, the American Psychological Association has a list of programs uh, that are clinical doctoral degrees in psych that will also um, be accredited by the APA. And so that way I can do a national and sometimes international search uh, for other grad schools of similar caliber by looking at the accrediting organization behind the UGA degree. Uh, professional organizations may serve the same function. So those interested in speech pathology, for example, might check with the American Speech Hearing Association uh, and they have an EdFind tool where they will allow you to search through their professional organizations listing of graduate programs that lead to certification and SLP. Um, so those are also worth checking out and getting to know as um, you consider different career fields. 
uh, entrance requirements, you'll want to find those out when you are looking into grad programs. As we've already discussed today, some may require uh, standardized tests and some may not. Um, some may specify letters of recommendation and some may not. Um, and they can be wildly different between programs. Uh, financial aid options. Somebody brought up cost as their primary and like immediate concern when it comes to selecting a grad program. So what you want to look at are, do they offer assistantships to students that allow me to work for the university when I go there and also complete my graduate studies? Uh, do they offer some other sort of funding, maybe out of state tuition equalization, where I don't have to pay out of state tuition to attend this program? Uh, some things along those lines will help you maybe narrow down the list of schools that you want to apply to. Um, so, so that's always worth considering. And that would be my primary thing too, looking back at grad schools back in the day. Uh, Michael, any thoughts on your own research process for grad schools? Um, yeah, so everything Justin said, I 100% think you should do. Um, there's two things that I wanna add. One, I highly recommend looking at the graduate program, like whatever degree type you're looking at, look at who UGA's graduate advisor or coordinator is because they will have a lot of really helpful resources and information to give you. So for example, I am a linguistics major, like I said, and I am currently applying for the Double Dogs program here at UGA. And so prior to applying to Double Dogs, I reached out to Dr. Langston, who is my graduate coordinator, um, to talk to him about both what UGA has to offer through the Double Dogs program, as well as other graduate school opportunities. And so that led me to my path, which is not everybody's path, but to get my master's here through Double Dogs and then to apply to a PhD program afterward. Um, so the second thing then that I wanna bring up outside of talking to the graduate coordinators here at UGA is the Double Dogs is a wonderful opportunity. Um, if you have, if you're interested in a master's degree and UGA offers it, then I highly recommend looking into that Double Dogs program. Um, if you want more information on that, that graduate coordinator um, is the same person you should probably reach out to, or your department may have what's called a dual pathway advisor. Um, those are the people who coordinate making sure that you complete everything for undergrad and everything that you need to get that Double Dogs degree. Okay, so just a couple caveats that we have here. Um, these are potential changes in the graduate school admissions process because of COVID-19. So these are some things to watch out for that could, um, you know, just slightly change your, um, your plans or your timeline or anything like that. So things that are probably gonna be different are traveling to campus um, to either visit or inter interview for those programs. Um, online program considerations may become a little bit more top of mind for you if, if things are going to be remote um, for a significant portion of time in the future. That might be something you want to consider. Um, opportunities to gain experiences also. So just thinking about like what are, you know, the assistantships that are offered? Are there going to be assistantships offered? Do I need an assistantship to either, you know, gain experience or waive my tuition? Um, is that going to be a possibility? during COVID at this, uh, at this program. Also want to consider, um, you know, the, the difficulties in kind of fostering those relationships for recommendation letters, like we mentioned. It's probably going to be a lot of phone call. It's going to be a lot of Zoom chat, um, probably a lot of email and not necessarily that drop in their office hours kind of conversation as it used to be. And then there's also going to be probably a lot of changes to that standardized test process. So um, definitely keep your eyes peeled for announcements, um, you know, from whether it's the UGA testing center or, you know, whatever location that you're planning on taking your standardized test, keep your eyes peeled for announcements or changes that may come because of um, the pandemic. Justin, you want to say a little bit about the article? Yeah, um, a lot of these points come from this article. It's a service that we use called The Vault and that we provide to you as students. Um, they have a blog that has a coronavirus filter that is helpful for finding information like this. Also, The Vault, a quick plug for it, is a great way to research grad schools, companies, internships, et cetera. So come see The Vault through the Career Center website. Um, but yeah, it basically uh, was an interview with an admissions consultant who 
um, you know, maintains knowledge of the field and they commented on each of these points. Um, the one thing I will have one really good way to foster these relationships are to attend your professor's virtual drop in hours, even if you don't have homework assignment questions in particular. I know the, some of the ways that I've kind of built that rapport with professors is definitely looking up what their research interests are um, and then just hopping in their drop in hours, usually emailing them before. Um, and then hopping in their drop in hours to just talk about whatever research interests they have. And then that conversation can kind of blossom into talking about grad school or whatever.